It is a privilege to be invited back again this summer. I'm very grateful for that. I apologize for the stool. Um, I had my knee replaced three weeks ago, and the walking is fine, it's the standing that hurts. So um, with your grace and kindness, I'm gonna not stand up and then pass out right in front of you, which would be <laughs> oh so painful. I love the summer hymns. I love the hymns that we sing in the summer, and, um, and the hymns that um, have been chosen for today's worship are just so beautiful. Does anybody get that place in your throat um, in the middle of some of these songs where you uh, think, if I keep singing, I'm gonna start wailing and crying? Does that happen to anybody else <laughs> besides me? I, I think that it's um, because we are always worshiping with the communion of saints, and uh, I had two very different grandmothers, um, one who could sing and play the piano and the other who couldn't sing, um, but did very loudly in an octave lower. <laughs> and, um, and I loved seeing, one lived in Connecticut and the other lived um, with our family in Illinois. And I loved singing with both of them. But these hymns that um, we've been singing this morning um, just make me wanna weep um, for my family. And, and um, I hate to tell you, but Great Is Thy Faithfulness is coming up next, and, um, and that's the one that almost does me in. Enough about that. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Holy One, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's text, the scripture, preaches itself pretty much. Um, and I'm, it's a privilege to be able to get up and say some words about it. But the truth of the matter, the heart of the matter, is the question that is in the heart of the gospel reading this morning. And that is, who do you say that I am? And I think that truly, this question is something that lives with us and in us and around us, underneath us, and just beyond us our whole lives long. Who do you say that I am? It is perhaps the best question of our lives. And I'll cut to the chase. It's one that we will never answer because we serve a living God and that God is always moving and always creating and always doing the next best thing. So who do you say that I am is a question that tomorrow will have a different answer. But we start with where we are, so we start today. So I'm gonna ask you today, who do you say that Jesus is? Is Jesus the healer? Is Jesus amazing grace? Is Jesus the light of the world? Is Jesus the baby born in Bethlehem or the one that we saw on the cross? So I want you to take the next 10 seconds and choose one answer. Who do you say that I am? Okay, one of the things I love about that is it's Pentecost all over the place. The, the prayer that we said right at the beginning about um, attending to the roar and the whisper, when we said that, it was all jumbled together and I thought of Pentecost. And I just thought of Pentecost again because it was all jumbled up, which is great. There were sisters and brothers this morning, hours ago, who worshiped on the shore of Galilee, who worshiped in Gaza. There were sisters and brothers hours ago who worshiped in the Ukraine and in Russia. There were sisters and brothers hours ago who worshiped in South Korea. There were sisters and brothers who are being 
haunted and hunted by this new terrorist group that has us afraid in Georgia. But they see them on the streets, sisters and brothers in Baghdad, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. They look these folks in the eye and they step into the church and worship. There are sisters and brothers in Ferguson, blacks and white who knelt together to receive communion. There are sisters and brothers who walk the streets of Savannah with no place to put their head at night and who long for a cup of water. So I will ask again, who do you say that I am? Did your answer change from your, how many, from your first to your last? Isn't it powerful and true that when we pray often, we first pray for me and mine? We do, because that's who we are, and that's how we are in the world. And then we get nudged just a bit, and we remember that we live in a global society where there are sisters and brothers around the world doing amazingly courageous things and sisters and brothers in our own city who are so afraid and longing. Who do you say that I am? This one that we serve loves all of us. Seven years ago, I had the privilege of going on a trip, and I say it this way, there were 18 clergy and three grown-ups that went on the trip. <laughs> and we got to go to Israel, and we spent uh, a week in the northern part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee, and we spent a week in Jerusalem. And my faith has yet to be the same. And I cannot and will not think of the Jerusalem wall the same since my trip. But one of those days, we went up to Caesarea Philippi, and we got to see the traditional site. Everything, if you've been to Israel, everything they started with, this is the traditional site of, because it's been a couple thousand years, and things might have moved and shifted. But we went to the traditional site of Caesarea Philippi, and my memory is, um, that it's on uh, the side of the mountain of, of Mount Hebra, Hebron, I think it is. And, um, and there are all of these excavations because um, Philip, the son of, of uh, Herod, was building this incredible tribute to Caesar. It was a Roman stronghold. It was a place where people knew who they were and who their rulers were. It wasn't necessarily a place that Jesus would take his followers. It must have been summer, because I imagine Jesus didn't take all 5,000, not counting the women and the children. Jesus took the 12 with him, his friends. I imagine it kind of as a summer retreat. You know how some folks that work together and, and uh, spend a lot of time, they go on retreat in the summer and they spend an afternoon. Well, it probably took them a couple afternoons to walk up. It's about 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And so they were up in this place. But this is also the place where the River Jordan runs down the mountain and begins to flow down through the fields into the Sea of Galilee. And I'm not sure if Jesus went for the Roman stronghold for this lesson today, or if he went to be reminded that the River Jordan starts very small and winds its way on its way to the next place. We don't know, but we're told 
that he comes to this place in Caesarea Philippi and he asks the question, the one that we've already, centuries later, been wondering about. Who do you say that I am? He says to them. And Peter, Peter, Peter says, you are the Son of Man. You are the Holy One. You are God's precious Son. And Jesus says, yes, Peter, you get it. You get it. On you, I will build my church. There's only two times in Matthew that it talks about the church. I don't really know what Jesus thought about with the church. I really honestly don't. But here we say that with this answer is the birthing of the notion of what we see of church. And so it is here in this stronghold of Rome and in the trickling waters of the River Jordan where Peter makes his statement and Jesus affirms it. And Jesus says, how do you know? How do you know this? And, and Peter says, I know it because the Holy One, God the Father Almighty, has told me. And Jesus says, you're not seeing with flesh and blood. You're not seeing what's immediately in front of you. You're not seeing what you can touch and smell and, and taste. You're seeing beyond that to the one who created and is creating still. On you, through you, I will build your church, my church, our church. And so we come to the Romans text. When I was a young feminist, I had a lot of trouble with Paul, I gotta say. Paul wore me out. And it was a lot of things that the gentleman was talking about um, that the Bible study is going to happen. And I hope that many people come because I hope that it cracks it open just a little bit. Even those of you who could recite most of the verses, because we serve a living God, what we open up every morning to read comes alive in us and through us. Who do you say that I am? So, Paul, don't, women shouldn't speak in church. Well, that lets me out this morning. It would have been a quiet 20 minutes, I'll tell you. <laughs> Obey your husbands, I can't even get into that part. There are so many things that he talks about that I just can't do. But as I have grown, Paul has gotten smarter. <laughs> and see, I think that that is one of the true things. If we stay in it, if we don't give up on it, the word opens up to even those of us who are the most broken. Those of us who are the most sure we're right. Those of us who don't need to learn a thing. The word can enter in and bring us life. This Romans 12 text, my partner Linda and I used at our commitment service, and it's always been a favorite of mine. But I'm going to pick up a little bit on, the, um, on what Kathy read and go a little bit farther. Although the, the verses at the beginning are enough, again, for another sermon. Don't be, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I, I've spent some time with Linda's mother since my knee replacement. She's been Hoke and I've been Miss Daisy in the back of the car. And she's had to, learn, to listen to a little bit of the sermon. And she and I had a big argument about what the last word was. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. And I was sure it was heart, and she was sure it was faith. And then we went to the Bible because it turns out we don't know everything, and it was mind. Which means keep learning. Thank you, Paul. There you go again. But anyway, I think that Paul's message this morning, if we continue on a little bit, how many Baptist Methodists do we have who brought their Bibles today? How many Methodist Methodists do we have that brought their Bibles today? Okay, it's me and Kathy. You're going to have to trust us that we've got the words in front of us. But um, I'm going to start on verse 9. And what I want you to do 
is um, imagine the greater church. Imagine the greater Christian church. All of us, Catholics, Protestants, all of us, imagine the church. Semicolon. Imagine the United Methodist Church. Semicolon. Imagine Asbury Memorial as you listen to these words. Remember that when it was only about me and mine, Jesus' words were smaller in our prayers, but when we cracked them open and we remembered things bigger, our prayers and our descriptions of Jesus got bigger. Well, it's the same way with the church, I think. I think that sometimes we get so worried about the roof and we get so worried about the refreshments in the fellowship hall that we forget about the greater good that the church is doing each and every hour of each and every day. And we can't lose sight of that. So beginning with verse nine, let love be genuine. Now I want you to think about these words in the context of church, in the context of the United Methodist Church, in the context of Asbury. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless them and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil with evil, but take take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, as 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 far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with one another, if it is possible. So I've been thinking about the cicadas. Anybody seen any cicadas lately? Those things are big, and I think they double as helicopters if you're not paying attention and you walk up close to one. And those are the ones that come back every seven years, right? What, yes? 28 years? 17? Really? Well, that's even more poignant. And again, I learned something. Go figure. What would happen if the cicadas that are on your front porch today are really coming to check on the church? And what's changed in the last 17 years? What would happen if the cicadas that are on your front sidewalk are really coming to check on the United Methodist Church? What would they see that's shifted or changed in the last 17 years? And what about the cicadas that hop in the car with you unexpectedly? If they've come to just check in on Asbury to see what's changed in the last 17 years, these creatures of God, these messengers, coming just to check every now and then, to see what would change in us. Are we doing this? Are we paying attention to the lowly? Are we practicing hospitality? Who do you say that I am? The ushers that come Sunday mornings. Are they practicing hospitality? Are they leaning in to the notion of serving those who might not have been served all week long? What about the choir? Who do you say that I am? 
Are you practicing love? As far as it depends on you, are you living peaceably with one another? Who do you say that I am? When our boys were little, we used to say prayers with them every night. And it was mostly because I was nosy and I, they wouldn't talk to me very much. And so at night after we would do the Lord's Prayer and, and um, sometimes another prayer or two, I tried to get them to memorize. We got through the 23rd Psalm and that was pretty much our, we got through most of Psalm 121. But I would ask them what, what's the best thing, the hardest thing and the hopeful thing from your day. I recommend it for all of us when we're putting our heads on our pillows. What's the best thing, the hardest thing, the hopeful thing of your day? But then we would sing songs. And one of Sam's favorite songs was uh, a song that I think we know pretty well. And I'm gonna end with that this morning. It's on uh, page uh, 707 in your hymnals. And I want us to sing the third verse first. And then Ray Bob says that this is a song you all like, so we're going to sing it again all the way through. But my, my, the words that are true for me, the third verse starts with, in our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing in our life eternity. In our end is our beginning. Where did I begin this morning? Who do you say that I am? Where do I end? Who do you say that I am? In our end is our beginning. May we lean into and love through each day when we answer that question. It's our life work. It's our life joy. It's whose we are. Don't be afraid to ask and celebrate your answer. Thank you.
Amen. Amen.